This is the Amplify Your Business podcast with Matt J. Hannum, where I have candid conversations with inspiring people and turn topics inside out to help you get amplified in business and in life. Today, I'm taking a slightly different uh, or sidetrack, different track, not not straight, straight business, um, which actually is my podcast really straight up business. I don't really think it is, but uh, today I'm talking about something which has been interesting me for a little while, I suppose, and I just thought I'd put down some thoughts and that there's five ways that autonomous cars could disrupt real estate. Now, you're probably wondering... Like, why? Why why does that matter? Well, well, it actually matters to everyone. I think it matters to everyone in business. We're in Australia, right? So as Australians, the great Australian dream or the standard dream for us to have is to own our own slice of, of this earth, you know, our own piece of real estate. And I just fear we're on the cusp through technology and a lot of things we always talk about, but certainly with autonomous cars, we're on the cusp of some potentially radical changes. And it actually does affect everyone. It affects every single person that's employed, every single person that's living in a property. So, I mean, that's most of us, except for a few unfortunate people. Um, And it's it's going to matter for all things from infrastructure, uh, roads, hospitals, you know, everything. So, let's talk real estate and let's talk about you know, five ways that I believe from what I, you know, from what I've read, from what I've seen, from what I expect could happen, five ways that autonomous cars could disrupt real estate. And look, you probably have others. I I have others. I just thought I'd put, put five together and, and see what, you know, see what your thoughts might be, see what, um, see where this might go. So uh, not a topic that I talk about much, but I just wanted to start quickly with um, a gentleman called um, Peter Diamandis. And he wrote an email uh, to to his list about more than more than this, but I just took a little excerpt out and I just wanted to read this to you. So, today, the value of a location is a function of its proximity to your workplace, your city's central business district, the best schools, or your closest friends. Which we well, you know, right? I mean, that's the reason why we made these choices. Like we we choose to live here because it's close to this and this and that. And my doctor and I work over there. I only want a twenty minute commute, or I'm happy to commute for an hour. So that's important. But but what happens when driverless cars desensitize us to distance? You know, things like the hyperloop. And if you haven't heard about the hyperloop, Google it. But hyperloop and flying cars and while this all sounds pretty crazy and and very much movie like, it's it's coming um, in a lot of ways. You know, Uber's working on stuff like this already. You've probably heard of them. So these things can decimate our commute times. You know, historically, every time a new transit method has hit the mainstream, our tolerance for distance has opened up right alongside them, sort of further catalyzing the city spread or urban sprawl, as we like to call it. So. If we're now making some changes in how we operate, like as you know, we already know that we're changing businesses, and I've I've talked about this. Like we we've definitely decentralised. A lot of smaller businesses don't need their footprints in the right city CBD locations. You don't need that 150 square meters of office space. Um, that's changed heavily. But beyond that, if these autonomous cars, and let's just talk about that. I mean, autonomous cars. I guess what we're talking about is eventually a vehicle that is going to untether you from the steering wheel. So it's probably not going to look and feel like the car that we're driving right now. Some will, some will, and and certainly I'm sure there'll be plenty of room for nostalgia in how, you know, oh, I want to drive this and I want to do it this way. But largely it could be a little box where you're, you're effectively sitting on a bench seat. You've got a table. I mean, there's no reason why it can't be set up for work, set up for play, set up for whatever you need to do. So this is what an autonomous vehicle is. So if these are out there, and let's say these start to become a critical mass, and as we've seen, even with things like Ubers taking over taxis, I mean, this is highly possible to happen quickly when it does happen. But what happens when we get desensitized to distance? And this seems to be one of the largest technological changes that we've had that will allow us to desensitize to distance. So the first point that I had is we won't need all the car base. Like 
you know, private buildings like right through the CBD areas, right through the inner city fringes, you know, these big parking stations. Well, we shouldn't need them. Uh, we'll still need some. Uh, but if largely these autonomous vehicles can be more fluid, which our technology suggests that we can have them and they can be more fluid, then they won't need to be parked. I mean, t- like right now, I'm sitting in my office, I'm a few k's from the CBD. I'm in the CBD fringe. Out the back sits my car. It drove 20 minutes here this morning. <laughs> it's based on my what, what I think my calendar looks like today. It's not going to leave until this evening and it's going to drive for 20 minutes and then it's going to sit in my – well, it's going to sit in my driveway like in my carport basically for the next however many hours until I get back out and drive again. Which is highly inefficient, and I there's a there's a series of calculations and things that I've had a look at before that go into this, um, and what it looks like. And if you just look up some stuff around Elon Musk, you can see how much more efficient we can make the use of driving cars. And even if we sort of invest in them ourselves and then put them out into the, I guess, uh, sort of put them on the grid, so to speak, much like we do with so- solar panels, and we can we can sort of lease them back into the grid if we choose to. But we won't need all these cars parked in bays. Right now, my whole car park's full of them. Every car park up this street's full of them. Every car park in this city is full of them, the people that are at work. Now, some people are on the road, but sure, not that many. The whole CBD's full of them. And that's just, we're in Perth. I'm in Perth, Western Australia. We're a little city. Tiny city. Like, it's, it's, it's insane just to think about that change. So, what are we going to do? Well, if we don't need these car parks, like, let's say my little office, we've got a little two-story building here. Uh, 450 odd square meters between the two. There's eight to 10 car bays. Well, I don't know. We could build a little alfresco type space or an outdoor gym or something. Who knows? Maybe we still need a car or two parked there, but maybe not eight. I think what, but yeah, we've got eight car bays out there. And this, you know, this is a little building. Every building in this street has eight or 10 car bays. Every building up, <laughs> everywhere has eight or 10 car bays. And this is, you know, just looking at the private ones, then you've got these giant pay stations. Now, we'll always need and want to park some vehicles around the place, but I'm just saying this is going to change significantly. I mean, could entire pay station parking sections, and let's face it, a lot of these sit in prime real estate. Like, could these be turned into apartment buildings? Like, will they be refurbed or will they have to be demolished? You know, what is this going to look like? And it's going to impact real estate. And if you're thinking right now that, oh, you know, I just own my house out here and what you're talking about there, Matt, that doesn't make any sense. That's not going to impact me. Well, you know, maybe think again because it's all related and it's all relative. So anyway, number one is we won't need all the car bays, both in the private buildings and the parking stations. But number two, we when we're driving, I mean, our commute is not going to be that important. The time is not going to be that important. And the main reason for that I mentioned earlier, we... Uh, will most likely be untethered to the steering wheel. Now, what does that mean? I mean, for many of us, especially those that drive to work, we probably often drive by ourselves, um, and obviously we need to drive. But if we're not attached to the steering wheel, and beyond that, we're not in a bus or a train, you are in a vehicle, um, you know, we we might be able to do a lot more with our time. I mean, we could use the time to work. And work could be laptop open, um, writing some emails, or we could make some calls in a much more comfortable environment, in a in a safer environment than when we're driving and focused on that, you know, on that commute ourselves. I mean, we could rest. I mean, maybe we can, you know, maybe they'll have different Ubers and and one of them will be, a, you know, like a bunch of sleeper um, carriage, like a carriage for one of a better word, but it's the same thing. It's like a, you know, like what used to be on a train. Maybe you would have a small um, box where you can stop and have a sleep. You can watch TV, you can do whatever you like, you can hang out with the family, you could have a meal potentially pre-delivered so you could sit there and have a meal whilst you were driving. I mean, if we're not tethered to our steering wheel and effectively wasting time, now let's face it, right now we do do other things when we're driving, which is a bad thing, but we, you know, we're often, people get caught texting and this and that and, and making a phone call is okay. So you can do multiple things, but you can't do everything. And what harm would there really be if in your first hour or your first hour of meetings or your first review of your emails in the morning was, let's say, in a nice, comfortable little autonomous vehicle unit 
where you didn't have to drive. I mean, would you really mind? And then because of that, would you basically say, well, maybe I have some other priorities as opposed to how close I live to my workplace? Which leads into number three. We can basically choose to live further away from our workplace. Now, why would we do that? I mean, why I would do that and why I think many, many people would do that is basically they'd be prioritizing lifestyle over the proximity to key locations like, you know, the CBDs or the the, the key areas where we work. But it's already happening and we could potentially only be maybe in those key proximity areas like the CBD for like a day of the week or a couple of days a month or let's face it, for four to five hours a day and we spend our other time in, our, in this commute process where we're actively doing things whilst commuting. Now, that could allow us to live in a much more interesting place, in a much more interesting location, spend a lot more on our property. Um, is, there's a whole series of things that that could allow us to do. But as history shows, Every time we have one of these technological shifts, we'll basically stretch that little bit further away from the prime CBD locations. And this change, I think, will change even more dramatically than maybe some of the, the earlier ones. So, you know, if we live that, fu- that much further away, we could do a lot more with our lives and our lifestyle. Number four, and this one is a very interesting one, especially for properties that are still relatively close to the CBD, but... But any property really is, look, you just freed up another room in your house, you know, the converted garage. I mean, do you need, well, for starters, do you need two vehicles? Probably not. I mean, how often would you be going in multiple, like even with a family of four or five, like do you often need to be using two vehicles at exactly the same time or could it not be worked out so you just used one? Immediately, you've gained some more space and maybe you've got another room. Maybe, you know, maybe that makes that becomes your office and you work from there most of the time. Commute your way in and out of the key CBD areas and you only you only go into those CBD areas for like two days a week for four to five hours. Maybe it becomes a gym, yoga room, a playroom for the kids, like, you know, whatever you want. But basically, you have a room freed up or you don't just have a parked car sitting there doing nothing, maybe dribbling a little bit of oil out um, <laughs> over time, depending on how new your car is. and. And it, it, it's not doing anything. So you could free up and use another room in your house to do whatever you want. Convert it. Don't convert it. Do it, use, do some woodworking. I, I don't care. It's just a free room. And that will impact your house. Like I talked about, and my last sort of main point is these recreational properties and locations. So I guess what we used to consider like almost like tree tree escapes and um, you know tree changes and beachside and beach changes. These things could be sort of quasi done in deciding where you want to live now. Um, you know, recreational properties with bigger blocks and closer proximity to nature, beaches, rivers, oceans. You know, that are a bit further from the typical CBD reach will be highly sought after and. It'll provide a lot more opportunity as well for local businesses in these semi-regional areas. But, you know, if you look at the demographic or the sort of breakdown in your current city or environment, obviously the, those places close to the river or close to the beach and close to the CBD are much more expensive. But if you could get a similar type property, but be an hour or two away, but only in a high-speed commute into where you need to be, it's going to change the game. I mean, why, let's say, you know, a property that would be worth $2 million here in in a riverside suburb of Perth, well, why is it that compelling to stay in that location when you could get the same property for 800000 maybe 90 minutes drive away, and it wouldn't impact your, you know, your ability to work? And sure, it might impact a few of your friends, but maybe they might move down there too. Um, you might have to move kids, um, change, you know, change schools for them or whatever, but could you substantially inject or amplify your lifestyle by making that choice, even just down to the fact that you don't need to pay that extra you know, $1.1 million for that property. Well, it, I think so. I mean, I, it's certainly something that I have considered. I haven't come close to doing it, but I'm looking at like even just our train networks and other things in the meantime, in the interim, because this is not happening tomorrow. 
but it's going to gradually unfold. And I think the quicker you can make a transition and move into understanding what it might look like, uh, the better. Because if you're jumping into a 30-year home loan planning to be there forever, um, you might, but maybe there's a better life and lifestyle for you. So I guess how does all of this impact the value of real estate? I mean, it's a good question. I don't have the answer, but it will have to put pressure on pricing at some point. Look, to what extent and you know to what end, that remains to be seen, but there certainly shows, or I believe, there'll be downward pressure on pricing for, say, like a one-bedroom unit in a very close to CBD proximity because it's going to be much quicker and easier to potentially get in and out more and cheaper to get in and out of these sort of CBD prime locations. And I just think there's going to be less pressure on having to be there all the time. I was I was driving through the CBD the other day and, and I just thought it just doesn't feel like the amount of people that used to be out there on the floor, you know, that only only maybe eight to ten years ago. So it feels different already. And maybe that's just a feeling, maybe that's completely incorrect, but it feels different already. So what does it look like? And the big question for you, I mean, the, it really puts a new spin on the whole location, 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 you know, and what does that really mean to us in the next few decades? But really the big question to you is how does that align with your strategy? Like is your goal to, to buy this new house in this certain location over the next, say, 10 years because of X? Well, how do these autonomous cars – And bear in mind, this is just one section of technology, which is dramatically changing everything. But this is just one piece of technology, technological change, this autonomous vehicles. And we haven't even talked about like delivery and other impact around like where, where you can get goods from, but how will this change where you want to live, who you want to be and how much you need to have the lifestyle and to live the life you want. I'm thinking it could be a considerable adjustment, but I guess the question is, can you and will you think about it and foresee and take action well and truly in front of being the last to move? Um, It will certainly take some time, but this is really going to have an impact on real estate. And if you're just jumping into the market, I guess, investing, just wishing and hoping that things will just go up, that's that might be a little naive, depending on what it is that you're looking to buy. So smart purchasing of property, you know, as is always, but that that makes sense. But you have as long as you've considered what, you know, what to what extent impacts like this might have over the next 20, 30 years, if you're actually planning to invest for that period of time. Um, you know, there's all sorts of investment decisions and I'm by no means giving advice. I'm just here talking about what this could do to impact um all of our real estate. But largely, I guess I'm talking about all of our lifestyles and how we operate from a work, life, commute, balance. And that really is the trifecta there, isn't it? You know, work, life, but commute is important. It is a it is a big piece of the puzzle. It's one of the things that takes up, let's say, two hours of our day, of our waking time. It's a lot of time and it's very important. And I don't think that we're going to be as concerned about how long this commute is as we might be willing to change like how often we commute and how effective we can be whilst commuting. So anyway, I'd love to hear your thoughts. Let me know if you've got other things or other reasons why you think autonomous cars will impact all of our real estate market and what that's going to mean for us as business owners, as people, as employees, as whoever, for infrastructure. I'm really keen to, to hear your thoughts. Um, yeah, send me a message, chuck it on one of the um, posts about uh, this podcast and I'm really keen to know what you think. And uh, I, I, personally, I'm just still considering all of this and, and trying to work out what this might mean over the next decade or two and that's going to help me influence my investing decisions as well. So if you enjoyed this podcast, please do share it with a friend, whether they're a real estate agent or um, someone who you think you know is purchasing a house or wants to purchase a house or owns properties or whatever that looks like. Um, if this could provide any value for them, that would be amazing. And I, yeah, um, thanks very much for listening to this point. And I look forward to speaking with you next time. Cheers.